So what promising Alzheimer's and dementia research has come about recently? What are the criteria to start the new medications for dementia? How do I qualify for a research study? These are a few of the questions registrants asked and that our expert panelists will strive to answer for today's Brain Matters webinar on Alzheimer's and related dementias, research update, and study opportunities. Thank you for joining us. I am Tony Tiano with the Johns Hopkins Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. On the webinar team with me are Dr. Corinne Pettigrew and Mrs. Joanne Scipio. Corinne is an assistant professor of neurology with the Johns Hopkins Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, and she will monitor the chat and Q&A boxes. Joanne will be our moderator. Joanne is faculty member with Kaplan's National Licensure Examination for Nurses Prep Test. As a registered nurse herself, she is the office manager for her spouse, Dr. Lawrence Scipio. Last but not least, she is the co-chair of the Physical and Mental Health Committee of the Annapolis Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. Now I turn the webinar over to Joanne, who will introduce our esteemed panelists and moderate the conversation. Thank you, Tony. This webinar will be answering questions about dealing with Alzheimer's and other uh, dementias. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. So I'm honored to have with us um, the first one, Dave Arnold, is Dave, first one there. Dave serves as a member of the Alzheimer's Association National Early Stage Advisory Group, where he raised awareness for Alzheimer. Dave has been living with Alzheimer's for three years now, and he is a volunteer with the Alzheimer's Association. He has experience participating in clinical trials. He started a nonprofit a year ago called Pop Pop Path which raises awareness and money to support people in Garrett County, Maryland, who are living with Alzheimer's or dementia. Next, we have Dr. Travonia Brown-Hughes. She's an associate professor in the School of Pharmacy at Hampton University in Hampton, Virginia, and an assistant community professor with Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, Virginia. Dr. Brown-Hughes is the current primary investigator for the National Institute on Aging funded Black American United Memory and Aging Project, and her current research focuses on the identification of differential risk factors for the early progression of Alzheimer's disease among midlife and older African Americans. Next, we have Rebecca Edelmeyer, and she is the Senior Director of Scientific Engagement for the Alzheimer's Association. Dr. Edelmeyer provides leadership on several of the association's national and international initiatives in dementia science related to biomarker testing, drug discovery, and therapeutic development. Next, we have Rohini, Rohini Killen, and she is a senior policy advisor with the American Association of Retired Persons Policy and Brain Health Teams, and she manages the work of Global Council on Brain Health. The Council is an independent collaborative created to provide trusted information on maintaining and improving brain health and their latest report and their latest report from this past July, July 2023, focused specifically on the importance of equity and brain health research. And last but not least, we have Dr. Paul Rosenberg, and he is a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. And he, he cares for Alzheimer's um, patients and does research on new treatment for Alzheimer's. Okay, these are our discussion is on the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias in Maryland. And we are going to the first thing we're going to talk about is the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias in Maryland. And with that, I would like to have um, Rebecca start giving us the, that information. Rebecca, uh, Dr. Edelman. Absolutely, Joanne, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this panel discussion today. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with you and hopefully we can answer many of the questions that have been proposed to the panel. Um, maybe I'll start a little bit with around what we understand about the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and, and related dementia. We know 
today, actually, that there's more than 6 million Americans living with Alzheimer's. Um, we know that number is really expected to double probably by 2050. And when we looked at a new study that was actually released by, uh, around our Alzheimer's Association International Conference this year in July, we know more about the different prevalence across a lot of the states. Maryland actually has is the state with the highest prevalence of Alzheimer's disease dementia in our country. It has a prevalence of about 12.9% across the Maryland population. That is about uh, 987,000 people. We also know that uh, Maryland really is uh, hit quite hard in the sense that we know from some of the new data that's been presented um, from a county level prevalence data estimate that um, Baltimore City, Maryland is actually the second uh, highest county in terms of Alzheimer's disease dementia in our country. Um, we know there's a lot of gender uh, as well as ethnic and racial differences and disparities in terms of Alzheimer's prevalence. We know that two thirds of Americans living with Alzheimer's are actually women. We also know that older Blacks and African Americans and Hispanics and Latinos are disproportionately more likely than older non-Hispanic whites to have Alzheimer's or other dementia. And there's a lot of population-based studies that still need to be done to truly understand the prevalence as well as the incidence of Alzheimer's disease and uh, other types of dementia in, in our country. I would like to offer the opportunity for others um, to weigh in on our panel on some of these estimates. I was hoping Dave is who was the our panelist who's living with Alzheimer's. I don't see him here. Is he here, or does anybody else want to weigh in on that? I think that Dave is having some technical issues signing on, but I am trying to reach him. I can say a little bit more if that's helpful. Just maybe in terms of our understanding of why we think um, the the these these patterns exist in our country. I think. Outside of Maryland, from what we've seen from this new newest uh, U.S. county level prevalence report, um, this is really the first time we've seen these types of estimates in people that are 65 years or older. We've really found that the highest U.S. prevalence of Alzheimer's are in the east, as well as the southeastern regions of our country. We believe that much of this may be due to the demographics of and characteristics of individuals living in these uh, particular areas of the country, including the individuals are older on average. Uh, we know age is the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, and as well as higher percentages of Black and Hispanic residents that may explain some of this elevated prevalence. Um, I think the take home message that we have today is that really this is being the first um, ever understanding of a county level precedence, how it's really impacting each of our communities is going to help us to develop better public health programs. It will also help us to better understand and pinpoint areas of high risk as well as need in our in our country so that we can define strategies that are going to be most effective and sustainable in our communities. The risk of moving to the second bullet from the first. Um, I think I'd like to talk a little about race and social determinants of health, because I think that's a likely, we, haven't, we don't really know the answer to this question, why Maryland, why Baltimore, but I think we have some very educated guesses. Um, Baltimore is heavily Black. Black Americans have a higher rate of Alzheimer's than non-Black Americans, and um, and social and de social and determinants of health may be quite different for blacks and whites. And this has to do with prevention. So a couple of differences uh, between uh, uh, in Alzheimer's between blacks and whites. Blacks are actually less likely to have amyloid in their brain. They're less likely to have the standard Alzheimer's process. We're finding this out because we're starting to do prevention studies where we go to people who are cognitively normal and find out if they have amyloid in their brain. We're finding out if these people have very early Alzheimer's. And whites have a higher rate of it. Now that doesn't mean blacks don't get demented, but they are probably getting, there's probably a greater uh, influence of what we call vascular risk factors. And basically most people who have dementia have some Alzheimer's process in their brain and have vascular disease. Vascular disease is the same thing that gives you heart attacks, gives you strokes and so on. The part that makes you demented 
is tiny blood vessels in the brain. And um, we don't have any specific treatments for vascular dementia. We try to prevent it the same, exactly the same way we prevent heart disease. So we try to get people to stop smoking. We try to treat diabetes, which is a huge vascular risk factor. We try to get people exercising, possibly losing weight, um, sometimes taking vitamins. Um, and all of these may be harder to reach in a, in a black inner city population. Let's just talk about diet for a second. The evidence points to the uh, that, a, that a heart healthy diet is also good for the brain. A favorite one is the Mediterranean diet. You don't have to move to Greece to eat this diet, but you do have to go to a grocery store. A Mediterranean diet is essentially reducing your intake of saturated fats. So instead of beef and butter, you might eat chicken, fish, and olive oil. It's really about as simple as that. If you live in a certain part of town, you may not have access to any of this. It may be quite difficult. There are food deserts in the city. And there's still food deserts in the city. In terms of cardiac prevention, uh, uh, folks are going to vary in their access to good primary care. Maryland's got good health care, but nowhere in the U.S. do we have a really evenly spread out system of, uh, of, uh, of primary care. So all of these point to a higher rate of dementia, why we see a higher rate of dementia in Blacks. I'm not quite sure it explains Maryland. I'm still, I'm still puzzled. I can tell you more about the social disparities than the regional disparities. And also too, I would like to chime in, um, when we think about the social determinants of health, you have to think about having access to care. You have to think about a group of um, individuals, their socioeconomic status. You know, again, as Dr. Rosenberg was saying, do they have access to a primary care physician? Also, too, you know, you think about the prevalence of diabetes and hypertension in the African-American community and how both of these diseases can put um, African-Americans at a greater risk for developing vascular um, dementia. Um, and then too, if you think about the level of stress that often comes along with living in an urban or inner city area over time, you know, again, that can have a detrimental effect on the brain. So um, again, this idea of prevention is so important, but that prevention needs to start, you know, earlier than 60 or, or 50, you know, it needs to start um, earlier than that in terms of when, when we, someone is in their 30s or maybe in their 40s. Um, adopting, you know, healthy lifestyle behaviors. And and if I may just, just to keep them underscoring everyone's message, um, a, another thing that the, the social determinants, uh, not, not only having access to care, but particularly in the space of dementia, it also gets to access to a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, so not only do you not have a, a regular primary care physician you can go see, but there isn't even maybe a specialist who can give you that specific diagnosis. Um, and then if if I could just go back to what we were, um, what Dr. Edelmeyer was talking about with in terms of prevalence. So that is actually also, it's projected prevalence, which, in, which is also means that there is a chance to what Dr. Rosenberg was saying, that there, there are things that can be done to mitigate some of that risk mm -hmm. if we can get to people earlier, mm -hmm. right? So if the projected prevalence is so high and it's particularly in these communities that are experiencing these issues around social determinants and lack of access to, to quality food, to quality care, to, to everything, if, if we can take action now and, and you know, try to mitigate that risk that they have of developing um, vascular issues and thereby vascular dementia, that, that is definitely a place that we can step in and, and make some serious change in reducing that projected prevalence. Mm -hmm. Oops, Joanne, I think you're on mute. Um, astounding to you when you hear those projected um, numbers. I know when I first heard those, and I'm you know right here in Maryland, um, that did concern me. And as Dr. Rosenberg said, you know we've got good health care in Maryland, but do we have access? And is the access equitable? Mm -hmm. Okay, 
think we might want to move on to um, our next um, next slide, which would be um, new methods for early detection, new medications, and new treatments. And as we talk about, maybe we can prevent some of this this projection. I think this all falls right in line with that. Um, next slide. Okay. Let's so talk about. Ask, yeah. Let's talk about new diagnostics first. Mm -hmm. Not quite there today, but we really may be there in a couple of years. One of the great innovations in the Alzheimer's uh, world has been uh, developing blood tests that are pretty good at diagnosing Alzheimer's. Now, uh, a lot of my colleagues would have my head for making such a bold statement. They'd, they'd say, well, then we're not quite there. It's not, it's not as good as this. It's not as good as that. But the progress made has been really quite incredible. Uh, up to now, we've had to do expensive or invasive tests to see to see the biologic process, either a spinal tap. Eh, not as bad as it sounds, but it still means you have a needle. Uh, you have to get get, a, get something with a needle or an amyloid PET, which up to now hasn't been covered by Medicare, but will be shortly. But the blood tests have advanced to the point where they are nearly as good as these other tests. Uh, they are cheaper, and of course, they're much easier to do, and they're pretty, they're pretty predictive. Now, keep in mind, if you, when you have a new diagnostic, if you don't use it in an intelligent way, you can really create a lot of havoc. So I'm not sure that primary care doctors should be drawing these tests on everyone who's over 65 in their clinic. If you're cognitively well and you, you have, have one a, a positive test, doesn't mean you're going to get Alzheimer's. In fact, chances are not. But it's certainly there's an increased risk, so you really want to use the tests in a in a test in a certain context. But it's very exciting and should be should be usable in a clinic quite soon. And also, too, um, Dr. Rosenberg, I just have a question for you in terms of when would you recommend or when would be the best time to have those blood tests done, um, ideally? And then once the blood tests are done, you know what is the course of action in terms of if I'm a physician, how do I advise, you know, my patient? Right now, the blood tests make the most sense to use in people who are having memory problems, okay. in people who are fine and normal. Uh, this is very similar to a PSA, prostate-specific antigen. Mm -hmm. If you just draw it on every old man in the country, I'm getting to be one myself, um, uh, you will, most of the tests look positive will be a false positive. And you'll run around doing a lot of biopsies and stuff for nothing. But if you restrict it to people who have symptoms, the tests can be quite meaningful. Same thing here. I think the tests will be useful in people who are having early memory problems. Um, Medicare covers an annual wellness visit. Uh, not everyone knows that, that, and not everyone knows to get one, and not every primary care doctor knows to do it, but most do. They get paid a bit extra, and it's essentially a a, a thorough physical. And I'm if I'm a if I were I'm a specialist, but if I were a primary care doctor, I would probably be drawing these blood tests in people who have memory problems. Okay, all right. And in addition to the blood test, would you think that, or would you recommend if someone um, seemingly when their blood was drawn, they seem to be at a higher risk for developing the disease? Would you? recommend that those tests be coupled with, let's say, um, imaging studies or like a, a PET scan um, in addition to, you know. I think it's going to depend on the situation, but there, there's two things. The first is the Medicare wellness visit is supposed to include a brief memory test, like a five-minute memory test. Mm -hmm. I think you do that. You listen to the patient and say, do you have any problems? You do the test and you see if there are any problems. And if you do, you proceed from there most likely we'll be getting a blood test as an, as an initial test. The next steps are we're working it out because the field is changing. It, you know, uh, five years ago, I would have said, oh, I'll do a PET scan. We may not mean, we, ne may, we may not need to do a PET scan or a, or a spinal tap. Most people though are going to need one regular brain imaging wherever it's available. It's usually an MRI scan. And the reason to do an MRI is it's, it's pretty precise. You get a really good picture of the brain. It doesn't always diagnose the disease. It's actually more to rule out rare things. So you can 
what the MRI will help you rule out whether someone's had an, a stroke they don't know about or a brain bleed or a okay. brain tumor. You just don't want to do something foolish, like miss something uh, like that. I have to tell you in 30 years of doing this, diagnose one brain tumor, wow. but, uh, but it's enough to make me go back and realize why I did all the others. Okay. okay. The, other, the other thing, and I was talking about uh, uh, vascular risk factors is the Medicare wellness business is a great time to look at cardiac prevention. The most important thing you can do to prevent dementia is control your blood pressure. I agree. And, and if you have diabetes, take care of your diabetes. I agree. And also and, too, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, I, I just wanted to say, uh, Rebecca, do you think that um, the individuals truly make the most use of that Medicare wellness visit? Um, because oftentimes, um, you know, it's that's that one time when you have an hour of time with your doctor and you can not only discuss you know, like the medications that you're on, but that's the time too that they can do like a in-office cognitive screen. But um, do you think that people are really taking advantage of that? I'm not sure people are fully taking advantage of it, but it's also, you know, our even within our facts and figures, we had a special report a number of years ago, not all doctors are even taking advantage of it. So it, we're really hoping to raise awareness, I think, as, as Dr. Rosenberg noted, that it's important to have these discussions. If you're having any concerns or you have any questions with your clinician to use that time wisely and to, to ask for a cognitive evaluation if maybe it's not being offered. Um, certainly advocate for yourselves. It's important to take care of your brain health across your life course. Um, and we know that early detection, I think, and that's a topic of this part of our session, is really, really critical in the context of especially new treatments that have become more available and making sure that you are able to get to the bottom of what is actually causing any cognitive impairment or behavioral changes or other features that you may be experiencing is going to be really key. And so those biomarker tests like blood tests, but particularly cerebral spinal fluid tests through the lumbar puncture and PET imaging, those types of tests are going to be really important. Um, for doctors to be able to even know whether you're eligible for certain new treatments. They have to confirm whether or not you actually have cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease versus vascular disease that may be causing your cognitive impairment. So that's really important. Um, and making sure that people have access to those tools and that doctors have access to those tools is critical too. So I think as Dr. Rosenberg noted, we just, we just received notice that Medicare was changing their coverage policy for PET imaging. So that's been difficult for many years for people to have access to that. And not everyone will still have access to PET imaging because they're not going to be near imaging centers. But again, there are tools out there to help aid in the diagnostic process. And so we really encourage a thorough evaluation. Okay. And if I may just connect this back to our, our earlier point of discussion, the more people who engage in these tests, the, the more types of people, the more diversity we get in people taking tests helps us better understand how it impacts different demographic groups differently, right? So to, to Dr. Rosenberg's earlier point about how Alzheimer's manifests in the, in the Black community, that we only know that because more people were getting tested and we were getting more imaging out of it. So it's it's really important to encourage more types of people to get more types of testing so that we have a, we have a better field of science to work from. Okay. Thank you. And before we move on to the next question, I just want to say that maybe we need to encourage family members and close friends who are noticing changes in the particular person to encourage them to get it because many times the person who may we may think that is having a change in their behavior change in their cognition they themselves will not admit it but maybe family members may see it and then they can encourage that person to get the help you know get this early detection and i we had um i guess a, we'll move on to the next um air uh, thing of new medications and treatments and someone did say was there a particular test. I saw that in the chat, a particular test for early detection. And I think we covered, talked about that in the blood tests and that kind of thing. So let's move on to new treatments and um, new um, medications. And I just want to interject just real quick that the Medicare wellness visit is covered by Medicare. So do keep that in mind. So there's no out-of-pocket costs. So at least that once a year visit, you know, use that to your advantage. And that's a change in the last few years. Medica Medicare is finally 
basically paying for the equivalent of an annual physical. And they're, it's a lot broader than just a physical. And it, by the way, it includes a memory test. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe just to touch on to bridge to the, to the newest treatment. So for many, many years, we've had treatments that can really help to um, temporarily uh, really change, or I would say uh, temporarily help with challenges to cognitive decline or cognitive impairment but they don't necessarily slow down the disease process. And so some of the newest treatments that have been approved by the FDA go after some of the underlying biology of Alzheimer's disease. One of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's is a buildup of a protein called amyloid plaques in the brain. It's one of the hallmarks. There's many other components to Alzheimer's disease, but these new treatments target those Alzheimer's plaques and help remove them from the brain. And they're approved for people who are living in the early stages of Alzheimer's. So that's people with mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease, meaning they have evidence of those amyloid plaques in their brains, or they have mild Alzheimer's dementia. So this circles back to the importance of early detection and accurate diagnosis, making sure that people are getting the appropriate testing to know whether or not they may be a fit for these new treatments that are really designed to slow down the disease progress uh, from and slow down the disease progression from happening. Okay, with treatment, were there any um, new medications that we want to um, let people be aware of? And someone, I think in the chat or one of the questions that came in wanted to know what medications are available to, um, alt you know, Alzheimer's and patients with dementia, what are just currently available as well as the new things that might be available? So there are two basic categories. One we call the older medicines, and they, they have a couple of different chemical categories. I'm just going to name them without going into detail. Aricept, galantamine, and Exelon, and then another one called Memantine. These are all symptomatic treatments. They do have some useful effect on memory. They don't change the underlying disease. They sort of give you a little boost, but you keep going downhill. Um, they're relatively safe. They do have some risks uh, and they are pills, but they're very widely prescribed. I would say most people with early dementia, some, some doctor or another has tried one of them or another. I find the results are hit or miss, meaning sometimes very good and sometimes zilch. I think they're always worth trying in early dementia. And as you get more advanced, their role is more controversial. Should you keep them up forever or not? Nobody knows. The new medicines, there's one FDA approved and one probably going to be approved in a few weeks. They are The one that's approved is called Lakembi. And the one that is not yet approved, I don't know the brand name yet. It's called Denanumab and it's from Lilly. These are very similar medicines. They are antibodies. The antibody is some is a is a is a protein that it's like a lock and a key. It it, it holds on to amyloid mm. and it really pulls amyloid out of the brain. It actually sucks amyloid out of the brain and into the rest of your body where you get rid of it. It's actually a little bit of a mystery why they work, but they work and they remove amyloid very effectively, like a vacuum cleaner. The majority of people who take the drug get rid of all their amyloid. However, the clinical effect is not as dramatic as that. They certainly slow progression and uh, they're pretty similar. You could say it slows progression by about 30% approximately. Another way of saying is in an eight, if you take the drug for 18 months, it seems to slow down progression by five months. That sounds like quite a bit and I'm still waiting to see what it actually does for patients' daily life. I, I, I think it's a little up in the air is that a lot? Is the glass 70% empty or 30% full, so to speak? These drugs are not benign. They have side effects. They can give you brain swelling and they can give you brain bleeds called micro hemorrhages. Most of these have no symptoms, but still need to be detected for safety. And so to take the drug, you got to get four MRIs in the first year. Yes, Rebecca, I know it says three, but if you look under the hood, you got another one you have to do it one year. Um, and they are uh, a lot of trouble to take. I, I, I would say fuss and bother. You need to go to an infusion center. Uh, for Lakembi, you got to get it every two weeks. So you have to schedule something every two weeks and go to an infusion center. 
we're getting this up and running at Hopkins. Uh, it's uh, slow going because it's a complicated infrastructure because we have to, we're very concerned to be prepared, prepared for rare but serious side effects. I would say most people have no side effects and it's pretty safe, but in rare cases, it can be quite severe and there have been even some deaths. You know, we, we pay a lot of lip service these days to the notion that patients and doctors and families um, make decisions collaboratively. And in this case, I put my heart in it. I think it's a collaborative decision whether to take these medicines. I don't think it's quite obvious. The other caveat is it's only a fairly small sliver of people with dementia that are going to be eligible. Rebecca, mind the number I've seen is somewhere under 10%, more than five, less than 10%. So however you slice it, you have to have amyloid in your brain. You have to be very early in disease. And, uh, and there's a number of eligibility criteria, including genetics. There, I've talked your ear off. So I haven't simply said, hey, I got a cure for Alzheimer's. We're very excited that this is a great first step. I mean, I've been waiting 30 years of my career to have a drug that slows down Alzheimer's. I don't think we're going to find it's the final step. And I don't think, I think we're not going to find that it's enough. And the, what is not clear when I look at these numbers, Rebecca, you've seen these all over the place, is how do the numbers translate into people's, um, people's ex lived experience, as we say these days? Um, uh, because at least on paper, they're not stopping the disease. They're just slowing the course of it. There are actually some hints that in early, early, early disease, it may actually, things may be flat, that people aren't progressing, but we're not sure. So that's my, that's yeah. my on the new drugs. And there's a second drug, denenumab, probably going to get approved. Very similar, very similar data. Probably going to get approved by the FDA. Uh, my rumor I heard was December sometime. Um, it has the advantage you only have to have the IV once a month. It has a disadvantage. It's got about twice the number of side effects as the as the first drug. Um, the cool thing is that uh, at least for the first drug, Lakembi. They're also working on what's called subcutaneous. Subcutaneous is like getting, uh, is like what diabetics do when they give insulin. And it's quite possible uh, that people will be able, if, if, if the studies work out, that instead of going to an infusion center, people will be able to use a little auto injector. Diabetics use this all the time and do it once a week. So uh, we're all hoping for that. And Rebecca, what so I heard is they don't have to have another phase three trial they just have to show equivalence uh, of sub-Q. Yeah, and I think that's what's exciting. I, I I just attended the Clinical Trials in Alzheimer's Disease Conference last week that happened in uh, Boston. And we're certainly seeing that, I think as is, is, uh, Paul noted, that there are a number of new results that continue to come out from these, what we would call first generation treatments. Um, we're continuing to dive deep into understanding some of their phase three clinical trials. There's already new formulations being tested, new ways that we could be administering these treatments um, that are gonna be easier for patients, less hassle for them to go into the office. Um, and hopefully, but I think as, as as Paul noted, it is very important that we we have to develop almost a new infrastructure in our field to be able to deliver these treatments effectively that hasn't existed before. Making sure that we're monitoring everyone and keeping everyone safe is a big part of what hospitals and clinics and institutions are spending their time doing right now to make sure that we can get these up and running as a component of treatment. And I think the future of treatment is very bright though. There are a number of treatments that are in the clinical trial pipeline today that we are very hopeful for. I think maybe just a pivot, I don't know into, uh, if that's okay, Joanne, into what we see coming in terms of research opportunities. Um, we know that there's, I think, somewhere over 140 different unique therapies that are being tested today for Alzheimer's disease specifically. And that's not even counting Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal neurodegeneration, vascular disease. That's just Alzheimer's disease. And that's, I think, exciting to see that there's so many diverse approaches that our goal is that you'll be able to treat Alzheimer's disease and other dementia like you treat cancer today or cardiovascular disease today. It's gonna to be a powerful combination of really effective treatments that are a right fit for each individual. 
that are safe for each individual and that work based on the underlying biology that you have in your brain and, and your body and that would be a right fit for you. So there's a lot of opportunity to continue to improve upon these first steps that we've taken with these new treatments. Um, and it is a very exciting time, I think, to note from our perspective as well that we're not only look, we're not only seeing treatments that are being developed for the early stages of disease, although that's where a lot of the focus is. There's also treatments that are being developed that can help with a lot of the very challenging symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and other dementia, the behavioral symptoms, mm -hmm. things like depression, aggression, agitation, apathy, um, sleep disturbances. Many of those treat many of those changes are happening at later stages of the disease and are very challenging for individuals and as well as their caregivers. And there's treatments that are in um, investigation today, under investigation today, that are going to help support, um, hopefully, um, not both drug strategies, but also non-drug strategies that are being tested. Okay, thank you. One of the other things that people were concerned about was the cost of these medications, and these medications being that they generally are for the people in the early stages of it. What's the cost? Will their insurance cover this? Or is this something that if you don't have large pockets or deep pockets that you may not be able to get the kind of medication that you need? Question, and we're really testing the water, still testing the waters on this. Medicare says they will cover. To be honest, the cost of the drug for Lakembi is estimated at 26,000 a year. And that's actually lower than the first drugs that were coming down this pipeline. If you add in all the other costs, MRIs and infusions, you're probably getting to about 50,000. I'm just guessing at that. If you have Medicare uh, B, you will have, a, I, I, the general rule is they cover 80% and you could have 20% uncovered. It could come to 10,000 a year. That's a lot. Uh, and I think that you really have to look in your heart and look at the numbers and say, am I Am I getting my money's worth? Uh, is it worth the risk? Is it worth the cost? Many people have Medigap insurance to pick up the, the you know, supplemental uh, Medicare insurance, but we don't know how they're going to react. We do, we do know that the commercial insurances have been generally starting to come around to cover. A lot of people in the Baltimore, Washington area are retired federal employees. A lot of them have Blue Cross Blue Shield. As far as we can tell, Blue Cross is going to be covering this, but you, you got to really look carefully before you sign on. And our understanding from the association's perspective is that Medicare is covering um, and they are covering um, the diagnostics as well, that, and as well as any of the MRIs that would be needed to monitor for safety. Um, the, there is the caveat that you would have to be enrolled into a registry. So the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services do have a registry. As long as you're enrolled in that registry, they will provide coverage. Um, and there, obviously, you have to be eligible for the treatment as well, um, medically. But we are also aware that the Veterans Health Administration is also covering. Uh, I wanted to bring that up too, Paul. So they are covering the meds for their veterans. Um, and we are aware of a number of pri private insurers that are, are providing coverage as well. All right. Thank and you. I also you too wanted to just um, interject that this underscores the need for just um, participants in research, particularly in clinical research. Um, not only does participating in a clinical research trial give a person access to cutting edge technology and treatments, but also too, you're provided with very um, careful medical attention and you have access to an entire team of research, you know, doctors and healthcare professionals. So, um, you know, just to make that push, um, you know, just for participating in clinical research. I think it's very important. And and you help improve the research. Mm -hmm. the, the more the more participants we get, the, the better the, the research gets as well. So exactly. one crying need for research is more minority participants. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let me give you a, it's a it's a um I'm not going to use the word scandal because it hasn't been done on purpose. But um for instance for this drug Lakembi the phase three trial, which is the, the trial that basically got it approved, 95% um, white. They didn't do that on purpose, but they were they did certainly had trouble recruiting minorities. This isn't just a matter of justice. This is biology. 
we need to know if the disease works as well in, in minority in minority people as in white people. We need to know, and we, we, we particularly need to know about uh, adverse effects. As I mentioned before, there's some evidence that uh, Alzheimer's is different in blacks and whites, is different in Hispanics and whites, and don't get me started on the whole rest of the world. I'll just, I'll just pick with the parts that I, that I, that I know better. Um, and that there's a lot more vascular disease in, uh, in, in, in blacks, which we, which we know already. Not to advertise, but just to mention some of the things we do at Hopkins, if you're in the Baltimore, Washington area, just, just to throw out a few, a few studies. Dr. Pettigrew uh, is instrumental in, a, in an observational study called the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, where they do annual evaluations and scans and blood tests and all kinds of stuff. I do more treatment trials, and I have trials for people very early who uh, have vascular disease. I have a trial for people who very early who have sleep problems. Um, I have a trial for people with very early disease and depression using psilocybin. That's a very special trial. And uh, it's hard. It's actually uh, the criteria are fairly narrow. Uh, I'm doing two trials for agitation in Alzheimer's disease, one with the drug Lexapro and one with THC. It's the active ingredient of marijuana, but it is also a legal drug. And um, I mean, those are just some of the some of the, the uh, studies we're doing. And I'll just throw out my phone number just so you have a one stop shopping number 410-550-9883. That's 410-550-9883. And if you, if you leave me a message, I'll make sure someone calls you back. I may also mm -hmm. add in, Paul, too, that um, the Alzheimer's Association has a clinical trials matching service. So it will include studies, as that Paul noted. Um, it's called Trial Match. And you can really easily find it at alz.org slash trial match. Um, or you can call our helpline and be connected to a trial match associate who will help find clinical trials that might be a right fit for you in your area. It's not going to sign you up for anything. Um, you're really welcome to search a variety of clinical studies. I think we have over 700 or 800 trials that are listed there um, as the ones that have the ethical approval and safety approval to be able to be conducted here in the United States and in other countries. And it's a way for you to be matched up to studies that might be conducted. Maybe you could find an exercise study or one that's testing in new nutrition or even drug trials or ones that are even testing new blood tests. There's caregiver trials and caregiver studies as well. Some can be done remotely. There really is a need, I think, as noted for more inclusive science to be conducted. And we would always welcome people to participate I think even some of the studies that I noted to you, those 187 trials for Alzheimer's disease that are ongoing today, we need over 57,000 people to participate in those treatment trials just to get them to completion. And that's just a, one portion of the studies that are being done in Alzheimer's and other dementia. Yeah. Now, so she will... two... oh, sorry. I was just going to say, we just had two um, opportunities, two different from the Alzheimer's um, Association, as well as Hopkins, where people can get involved in the research activities. Um, very important. And I see something in the in the chat, somebody is saying um, had something about taking care of a, a parent and how draining it is. And um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Edelmeyer, you just said that there are opportunities for caregivers and, you know, to be involved in the research as well. So that's a good thing. And Dr. Um, Brown Hughes, I'll give it back to you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I just wanted to interject that um, someone may say that I don't necessarily feel comfortable participating in a clinical drug trial, but there are all types of studies that you can participate in. Um, again, there are experimental studies that might include cognitive testing in which you have to um, take memory tests. There are different types of invasive studies, of course, that you know you may have to give, might have to give a blood sample. Um, brain donation studies, um, imaging studies, but there are also um, studies called observational studies. And those are studies in which you might be asked to participate in a focus group so that we can learn your opinion about various issues, or you may be asked to complete a survey or questionnaire. You know, that is considered research because again, we want to hear from you. We want to know how um, different participants or different um, segments of the population may feel about different issues. And again, it's all a part of that piece of a puzzle 
that we're putting these pieces together to try and come up with solutions or answers for you know different challenges or um, different topics. And I just wanted to uh, also to add that my study, the Black American United um, Memory and Aging Project, um, the study itself is completely online. And I asked my participants to complete a, a questionnaire. Um, they have to do a series of um, brain games that they play online. And we're asking them for a urine and blood sample that they can send in and we compensate them for everything. And again, um, that's all online. So, you know, no needles or anything of that nature. So again, there are all different types of research out there that you can be a part of. And uh, if I could just go back to that, that question about caregiving, um, it is absolutely draining, Evelyn. I, I see your comment. It, it is a very uh, a, a draining thing to do. It, it's, it's fulfilling, but also draining. And I, I just want to put out there that AARP has tons and tons of resources to help caregivers. I'm, I'm happy to put that out there. We also just very recently published a dementia resource guide with um, state by state facts and uh, numbers to call in, in a, every single state and, and who you can get help from. Um, so I will put a link to that into the chat, but um, we do have a, a whole division of AARP devoted to caregiving and assistance for caregivers. So I, I just, if, if it's helpful to you, I'm, I'm, I recommend going there as well. And someone wanted to know, are there any qualifications for getting involved in research? Um, each, each study has its own qualifications. Mm -hmm. I would say the most important qualification is keeping your head straight that it's research, that it's an experiment, and, and that it is highly regulated. People sometimes ask me, you want my mother to be a guinea pig? And I say, yes but under highly regulated circumstances. For me to, uh, to, to do a study, I usually need approval from the Hopkins Human Subjects Board. I usually need money from the NIH, and I usually need some kind of approval from the Food and Drug Administration. I can't just cowboy it, just do what I want. So um, I would say in general, uh, 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 you, you, what you need to know in your heart is whether you're looking for a treatment study where we're hoping to find a cure for something, and whether you'd be willing to be in what we call uh, a, a controlled trial, where the where if you get a drug, it might be a placebo, a sugar pill, or it might be an active drug, because you really can't test a treatment without a rigorous test. Okay, thank you. We want to move on now to the critical role of research volunteers. How important um, volunteers are and the study participants to advance brain health for all. Okay. I think they're absolutely critical. I think that for us to make any progress, we need everyone to work together. And I think a number of us have noted today that um, we haven't had an opportunity to make sure that we are able to be as inclusive as we want to be in the science. And that's on the researchers. That's on us to make sure that we're out reaching all communities to invite people to participate, to make it easier to participate, and to make sure that trials are um, creating eligibility requirements that aren't so burdensome and also are also as inclusive as possible. So there's a lot of things ongoing in our field right now to try to make sure that we can have um, as many people participating so that the discoveries that are made, whether they be on discoveries that improve care or discoveries that improve new treatments, they're gonna actually be beneficial for everyone. Mm -hmm. And also too, I just wanna interject that keep in mind that by the time you hear about large scale trials, those are usually um, clinical um, trials that are in phase three. So because of that, um, many of the side effects, you know, have been determined to a certain degree. Because of that, the study has already been um, tested in smaller groups, often um, a healthier group of participants. So it's not like we're taking an arrow and shooting it in the dark and saying, hey, let's see what happens. You know, so do keep that in mind that, you know, by the time that you are asked to become a participant, that we've, um, as scientists, they've already 
determine many of, again, the side effects, the right dosage amount, or, um, you know, what particular um, disease or disease state that this particular drug seems to work best with. So again, it's not like we're just kind of throwing balls up in the air and, and just seeing where, where they land. So a lot of research has been done. And usually in phase three of a clinical trial, that's the trial period right before they take all of that evidence to the FDA and say, hey, you know, these are the outcomes we would like to move forward and make this drug available to the general public. Okay, thank you. So how it's very it's obvious that it's very important that we have um, people volunteering to be involved in research. If we really, really want to be able to one day cure, you know, make sure this is not something that's, you know, it's something where we found a cure for, we want to be able to manage it, early detection. Um, I think it's very, very important. And hopefully, um, you know, a lot of people that have family members who have had it, they are they have volunteered. I know several people who have family members who have had it and they volunteer to be in studies just because of that. So um, it's really important that we get the volunteers to, um, because we're not going to know how to treat, you know, specific, specifically in the African American community. And if we're talking about Maryland having such a a projected high rate, we definitely need to be involved in research and studies if we're really going to, you know, get a handle on this. And maybe, as um, uh, Rohini said, if we're able to get a get a hold on it, maybe prevent it from going to those levels that we have projected. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any question? Any other questions that we? We're, Dave, who was our um, person living with Alzheimer's, he's not been able to join us. So we thought that was going to be a real treat to hear from somebody who's living with it, who's been in clinical trials and what that means. But maybe next time we'll be able to get someone like that. Okay. Thank you very much, Joanne, for moderating this panel and to all of the Brain Matters volunteers who serve on our committee from the Johns Hopkins Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, the Johns Hopkins Resource Center for Minority Aging Research, the Alzheimer's Association, Greater Maryland Chapter, and now national level. Thank you for being here, Dr. Elmeyer, and the Global Council on Brain Health and Independent Project of AARP, as well as Joanne Scipio from Delta Sigma Theta Annapolis and Jackie Seth from the Columbia Chapter. We really couldn't do this without you, but you know, now that we're in our second year, you know, I, I can say that I'm really very proud to have spearheaded bringing this group of people together about this sort of an awareness campaign to uh, focus on the Baltimore region as well as the national level and to share science-based information about current topics concerning brain health, health disparities, memory loss, Alzheimer's disease, and related dementias. You know, many thanks to our panelists, the volunteers on the steering committee, and to our webinar team, and to our audience for attending and submitting your very thoughtful questions ahead of time and for participating in the chat. I want to let you know that in a few weeks, the registrants are going to receive a link to this recording, as well as a takeaway sheet that I'll put together covering some of these resources that were mentioned. So thank you so much again for being here. Until next time, stay safe and be well.